Hello everyone. We are into a part of verse of the day where we need to talk about the beginning. We need to talk about creation. We need to talk about evolution. We need to talk about the flood, the beginning of history. And talk about some of the first civilizations after the flood. So before we can go into any deeper theological things, these are what we need to talk about. So we're going to begin in Genesis 1.1. But first, I want to talk about some evolution. So today's verse of the day is Romans 1.20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. You can tell that God exists by all the different things in the world, the physics, the intricacies in our cells, the snowflakes, the, the magnetic field that protects us from solar radiation. You can tell ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. So that's Romans 120. That's going to be our, our focal verse of the day for today. Now, we are going to talk about evolution. The way I always think about evolution is Chocolate City sits on Marshmallow Mountain. You're like, what are you talking about? This is how I teach kids, how they remember the different types of evolution. Can you see it? It's a Chocolate City sitting on Marshmallow Mountain. Why do I use that for evolution? Because it's a pipe dream, it's a religion, it's a faith just like any other faith. Only the chocolate, the key is the chocolate isn't even really chocolate, it's poop. <laughs> but no, that's how I remember through that acronym, Chocolate City Sits on Marshmallow Mountain. Look at this display from Harvard University. The reason I bring this display up is that people try to take evolution and just say, no, it's solely biological. But it can't be solely biological. Evolution had to start from the Big Bang through the chemical, stellar, organic, macro, micro. So that brings us to our acronym, CCSOMM. First you have cosmic evolution. The explosion of nothing created everything in the world today. The Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing. Literally nothing, nothing created everything. The Big Bang is an amazingly difficult thing to wrap your brain around, which isn't surprising. 13.7 billion years ago, we think it was tiny. Nothing, literally nothing, was tiny. And then something happened. Nothing created all the matter we see in the universe today. Nothing is more powerful than nothing. And that's what trips most of us up. It was the explosion of nothing. Then you have chemical evolution, where the chemicals started evolving. And then you have stellar evolution. You have a chicken and egg scenario. Which came first, the, the chemicals or the stars? Then you have organic evolution, where non-life material created life material they call that abiogenesis then you have macro evolution where there are big changes in kinds of animals you have a a one-celled organism and it changes to a fish and it changes to a banana and it changes to a monkey and it changes to you and then you have micro evolution which is the different kinds that that we see you take a light-skinned person, or you take a white person and a black person, you make a light-skinned person. Those are the six types of evolution. Five of them are a faith. They cannot be observed, tested, repeated. One of them is just, they call it evolution, but it's just how, how God made us. We still change within our kind. A, a light-skinned person is still a human, just like a black a, a darker skin and a white and an Asian, we're all human. Different breeds of dogs, they're still dogs. 
So I want to get into, I want to break each one down to show you why it's a faith. Let's start off with cosmic evolution. Cosmic evolution said a long time ago, there was explosion out of nothing. Nothing exploded and created everything we have here today. Nothing is more powerful than nothing. And that's what trips most of us up. It was the explosion of nothing. Well, that's against the first laws of thermodynamics. That energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It's against the conservation of mass. That matter cannot be created nor destroyed. And it is against the second law of thermodynamics. That entropy occurs. Things deteriorate over time. Things do not move towards order as time goes on. You put billions of years on things, they don't move towards order. Things move through disorder. Deterioration occurs. So that's, a, that's one of the reasons why. And I like what, what the word says. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, which can represent time, God, he was always there, created which can represent energy, the heaven, which represents space, and the earth, matter, and the earth, matter. Those four things had to come into existence all one, and only some one, God, something that was intellectual, that was smart, could have created all this stuff, because it stood outside of time. God stands outside of this dimension, that is why he was able to create all of us. The Bible is the only one book that in its first phrase explains everything that can possibly explain everything that we see today. And then you read further in Genesis, Genesis 2, 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. It was finished. You won't get any new matter. You won't get any new energy. It's against the laws. The laws of physics is all finished. As John 1, 3 says, all things were made through him. And when they talk about him, they're talking about Yeshua, Jesus. Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made through him. And without him, there was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Nothing new is made. He made it all. That's it. That's it. So that's cosmic evolution. In their faith, they believe that nothing created everything. Nothing is more powerful than nothing. And that's what trips most of us up. It was the explosion of nothing. In Christianity's faith, we believe that God, an intellectual designer, made everything. Which one makes more sense? The next thing we have is chemical evolution. The scientists believed that hydrogen and helium were of the first two elements to be created. But they say also that the stars created the various elements in the world. So you get to stellar evolution. So we have a mismatch. You have which came first, the stars or the elements? And that is something that they really can't understand. But how did the stars pull together? How did the stars pull together? explosion came how did they come together they don't quite understand gravity so they bring up different theories like dark matter and honestly it doesn't stick it doesn't stick just like the stars as nbc news in, in january 6 2021 says maybe dark matter doesn't exist after all new research suggests but they got to keep pushing to find something just because it's been disproven by different physics, scientists, it's a faith that there is no God. Why would someone want a faith that there is no God? Why would they pull to please let there not be a God? Because if a man, as we just talked, if a man knows that there is a God, they know that they're accountable. So they have faith that there is no God. Please let there not be a God. So you have stellar evolution. Then you have organic evolution. I always show this picture of a rock in life. Why? Because organic evolution is also known as abiogenesis. 
Bio means life. Genesis means beginning. A means the opposite of that. The opposite of life creating a beginning. When I make a baby, that is biogenesis. Me and my wife have made Kai. That is biogenesis. A biogenesis is non-life creating life. So they believe that you come from a rock. A rock, white water, and lightning. It took million, billions of years. It couldn't just happen instantly. It has to take billions of years to hopefully do it. Why does it have to take billions and billions of years in a galaxy far, far away? Because we cannot repeat it today. If you put time on it, maybe it seems more believable. We just can't. It takes too much time. How long does life live, huh? How long does a cell live? How long will you live? Less than 100 years? How long does an ant live? Probably less than 10 years. Well, you see what I'm saying? Billions and billions of years, really? And they try to repeat this. Repeat this, this synthesis, this understanding with a Miller-Ure experiment. In the Miller-Ure experiment, they're trying to create life in a lab. And I'm going to show you what the National Institute of Health first says about this. The experiment usually progresses as follows. Within a day or two of sparking and heating, a pink stain is formed on the sides of the discharge flask, and the water in the trap acquires a yellowish color. After several days, the stain turns dark red and then turbid, while the tap trap water changes color from yellow to dark brown. At the end, the primary substance in the gaseous phase become carbon monoxide, CO, and nitrogen. The dominant material in the water trap is a complex mixture of organic molecules, which really doesn't mean anything besides hydrogen, carbon, carbon nitrogen, and oxygen. That's all uh, things that are in us. But they say organic molecules, so you're like, oh, they made it? No, they didn't. Including aldehydes and cyanides, as well as tar. They made tar in this contraption to make life something that will kill life mostly insoluble in water the simplest biological useful amino acids are also present mostly glycine and alanine that together compose one to three percent of the solid residue as well as smaller amounts of other biological amino acids both l and d chiral forms of amino acids are produced in roughly equal amounts race mix mixture even though a recent report suggests that biological relevant l forms may be somewhat abundant and then i'm going to drop down to the end of it some of the above argumentation can be easily refuted for instance the methanogic archaea carbon monoxide is a nutrient further kuhn and somerville have attained in 1971 a strain of escherichia coli that could metabolism, metabolize several D amino acids. Let me break this down to you because they don't give you all the evidence because they want you to believe in their faith. But let's look at the percentages of what they actually made. And someone broke this down very easily. If you notice, there were four substances used in this experiment. Water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. These apparently were the four gases that our young Earth's gravitational pull could handle. An interesting thing about this is that Miller and Ure decided to leave out oxygen. Oxygen is essential gas to living organisms. They knew, however, that whatever was created in the experiment would oxidize. You know, leave a banana or an apple out on the counter too long, it turned brown. It oxidizes. Essentially, it dies. One other thing... I want to bring up is the primordial soup that Miller and Ure produced from their experiment. Today's brilliant scientists say that the soup, or sludge in mine, was rich in amino acids. Wrong again. Fortunately, yes, I said fortunately, the sludge they produced was only 85% tar, which is poisonous, 13% carbolic acid, and 1.05% glycine, an amino acid, 
and 0.85% alanine, another amino acid. Hardly even 2% of the sludge was amino acids. On top of that is the fact that only 2 out of the 20 amino acids required to create a single living cell were produced. So, and they were backwards. Also, those amino acids were also backwards. So what I want to bring up also on this, the amino acids were backwards. They essentially made the most basic of a letter to create what they think would be something that could create life, okay? You need RNA to make DNA. What essentially they think they made one letter. No, 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 no. To make life would be as to take a paper factory and an ink factory and blow them both up. And they go sky high. And when the ink and the paper comes down, someone would have a dictionary. What is the chances of that? But your cells... I believe it said if you could take out one cell and strand your DNA line, it would go back and forth to the sun. I think they said about 20 times. Let me look that up. It says a strand of your DNA would stretch back to the sun and back, which is 93.5 million miles away, 61 times. It would go back and forth 61 times, 93.5 million miles away. That's how much complex a human life is. That's how complex life is. So he made one letter that happened to be backwards. No, you need RNA. You need information to make information. So instead of just blowing up an ink factory and then blowing up a paper factory and making a dictionary, you would actually have to make a whole library, a whole library of libraries to equal life. It takes information to make information. And not only that, Miller Ure, if they did create life in a lab, would that not be biogenesis? They are intelligent. They intelligently design life to be created in their lab. <laughs> That's the funniest thing about it. Yet you expect water, a lightning, and a rock to create everything? No. So then, let's say it did happen. That's another fake. You have mac macro evolution. And that's big changes. That's changes from a banana to, I don't know, a monkey to a human. Okay? Big changes in kinds of animals and life and plants. Well, for that... I look at Lucy. I'm going to play a video about how they tried to say Lucy was the missing link. I did this in a verse a day a while back in debating. But let me show you this again. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. This has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. 
He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. I think this is so funny. Because what is this, make your own fossil day? You just sand down the bones to fit the way that you think it should fit? Instead of actually just taking the evidence and taking that face value and using the scientific method to get to your conclusion. No, ladies and gentlemen, Lucy is in fact part of their faith. They must make it work. Instead of just taking what they see from the natural world, they'll take a sander and grind the bone till it fits. If it don't fit, you must acquit. So there you have it. The Bible talks about ten times in the first chapter of Genesis that they shall procreate after their own kind. That they shall procreate after their own kind. That they shall procreate after their own kind. Ten times it says the various animals and species or and kinds will procreate after their own self. Scientists use species. Bible just talks about kinds. Okay. A horse is a horse. If it can mate with itself, uh, mate with within its kind, it guess what? It's the same type of animal. It's the same type of animal. And the word, the the only thing that does occur, so macroevolution. Another faith. The only thing that can occur is that we can procreate within our own kind. And I like what Genesis 7, 2 through 3 says. And this was at the flood when God came and got the animals that he wanted that were not corrupt at the time and the people of every clean beast thou shalt take thee by sevens. By sevens. So they had seven pairs of possibly, I don't know, dogs those seven pairs of dogs could have made all the different types of dogs today when you combine them the male and his female and a beast that are not clean by two i don't know exactly what unclean animals are but possibly the pigs okay take two of them they make the uh, that's why you'll see a smaller divergence in pigs a fowls also of the air by seven the male and the female, to keep alive upon the face of all the earth. So yeah, it's a myth to just think that God just had a pair of every kind. No, some of them he took seven pairs of animals so that you can have such a divergence. We will continue to talk about this more and actually get into the word and let's break down the beginning all the way up through Nimrod. I think it's important. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. And may many be saved. And may we get good understanding and hear with open mind. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Goodbye.